From Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. Hello and welcome to today's episode of Middle East Focus, the Middle East Institute's podcast on regional affairs and U.S. policy. My name is Intisar Fakir. I am the director of the North Africa and Sahel program and a senior fellow here at the Middle East Institute. I'm delighted to be hosting today's episode where we'll be talking about French-Algerian bilateral relations. This past Saturday, French President Emmanuel Macron concluded a three-day visit to Algiers and Wahran with a large delegation, including six ministers, leaders of French businesses, intellectuals, scholars, and advisors on religious affairs, on North Africa, and on French foreign policy affairs as well. This is Macron's second visit to Algeria since his initial visit in 2017, um, shortly after his election. This visit was meant to mark a bit of a reset of the bilateral relationship, which has always had ups and downs, but was marked with recent tension following some provocative remarks from President Macron last year. Macron infamously challenged whether there ever was an Algerian state prior to French rule, which lasted for 132 years, with Algeria fighting a very violent war for independence. Macron's comments predictably upset Algerian government and population and strained relations for several months. And of course, there is a number of elements to this troubled relationship between France and Algeria that have either been affected by the recent diplomatic spat or were part of what drove the tension in the first place. There is migration. France is trying to pressure North African governments, including uh, Algerian government, to do more on illegal migration by limiting legal migration. There is also trade, especially gas. Algeria is the third largest exporter of gas to Europe after Russia and Norway. There is also the security element, which involves cooperation on terrorism. And the Sahel is a particularly important part of that. Of course, France has been involved in the Sahel since 2013. Before all of that, there is the people element of this relationship. France is home to a large population of French of Algerian descent, French Algerians, and Algerian immigrants. My guest for today's episode is Francis Giles, a political scientist and senior fellow with CDOB, Barcelona Center for International Affairs. He focuses on emerging security, political, economic, and energy trends that affect North Africa and Europe. He has a long career as a journalist with the Financial Times, covering international capital markets and North Africa. He also writes for the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Le Monde, El Pais, and La Vanguardia. Welcome, Francis. Thank you very much for your invitation. So maybe let's start our conversation with an assessment of the trip. Did Macron, did France um, essentially achieve what they wanted to achieve from this visit? I think the French president did achieve much of what he wanted to achieve, not everything. His main aim in the visit to Algeria, and this was illustrated by his 90-strong delegation, at least two-thirds of which were made up by academics, sporting personalities, cultural personalities, businessmen, young businessmen of Algerian origin. It was meant to be a seduction trip vis-a-vis the Algerian young, particularly the young entrepreneurs, the very clever IT startup people, of whom there are many in Algeria. And it's also a way of speaking to the suburbs of France, where there have been many problems, social problems, not just with people of Algerian origin, but with people from African and North African origin generally. In a way, the composition of the delegation was fascinating. It would have been impossible 15 years ago to imagine a French presidential delegation to Algeria composed for two-thirds of French people of North African origin. These people, like the people of Moroccan and Tunisian origin, were not visible in the upper reaches of French society 15 or 20 years ago. Today, they are more than visible. It's a nascent bourgeoisie, if you will, entrepreneurs, and Monsieur Macron is receiving them, is befriending them, 
and is putting them to full use because uh, when he looks at Algeria, he sees a country which is a command economy, which is not a reformed economy, which has a number of powerful tools like gas. And in view of the crisis today, one can understand it, a powerful army, a good security forces, but a country which does not offer many opportunities to young entrepreneurs, particularly IT startups and platforms and all this kind of thing, which is so important, nor does it offer much cultural freedom. That freedom is in France, and you'll find many Algerian musicians, many Algerian IT engineers, entrepreneurs, wanting to move to France because they are frustrated about the lack of reform in Algeria. Hence, Monsieur Macron went to the western city of Wahran, went to visit the shop or the studio, rather, where all the Rai musicians have come from all the Rai musicians. Rai is the music of Western Algeria, which has conquered the world. He visited the people who have been the great names in this music. And the reference here is DJ Snake, who is internationally known. So he's typical of this kind of Franco-Algerian relationship on the human level, but which also cuts across enterprise. You teased out a number of the key aspects of that relationship, and I, I want to dig a little bit more into the people and the history element, which is what you were just talking about. Can we talk a little bit about the history? I think what gets lost in a lot of this noise, particularly about the comments that Macron made last year, is that Macron is one of the first president, maybe the first French president, to actually come into this with a willingness to look a little bit into the past. Here I'm referring to the uh, colonial past, the history, the legacy that France had in, in Algeria. He commissioned a report that was done by uh, a number of figures, including, I think, led by uh, historian Benjamin Stora, there is a conversation there about what happened. It's not to the level that I think Algerians are talking about, where there is an admission of guilt, some kind of reparation, but there is a conversation there. So let's talk a little bit more about this sort of troubled history and what the French are trying to do to sort of address it, or at least show some willingness to address it. And how is that being received in Algeria? Well, I think that the steps being made by Monsieur Macron are small steps because he's got to think of French uh, domestic opinion and France has been veering to the right in the last decade. So you have to be careful because the wounds of Algeria are still open for the older generation. So he has made a number of steps which are significant, but of course, they're never enough for the Algerians. It's an ongoing problem and different countries choose different methods. The French have chosen a method of small steps. It's being helped by historians who are writing books, which are making history clearer. Um, but of course, the Algerian War of Liberation was particularly, uh, it wasn't so much that it was particularly violent, which it was, is that Algeria uh, in the 100 years or the 90 years before the French left were département français. They weren't overseas mm -hmm. Territories. Exactly. They were not protectorates like Tunisia and Morocco, which were able to keep their political structures, albeit with no power. Algeria was, it's a bit like if you shredded a piece of material sh thread by thread. And so uh, the Algeria was utterly destroyed. Uh, the conquest took 50 years, from 50, 1830 to 1850. Half the population emigrated or was killed or disappeared with disease. And then the, free, the French rebuilt in Algeria, basically for the French and for the Italian and Spanish colonizers, right? Um, and then the War of Liberation, which was very violent since it toppled the Fourth Republic in 1958, brought back General de Gaulle, who was able finally to find a solution. But after much bloodshed, civil war within among the French, amongst the Algerians, plus the fighting between the Algerians and the French. Uh, so it was a, a very bitter conflict, and not all the files are open. And it's bitter because not only the French are making moving forward, but the Algerians, at least certain Algerians consider they're not moving fast enough. But at the same time, the Algerian leaders are very reluctant 
to accept that it was a civil war amongst Algerians. So it's a very complicated history and this takes time. So I wouldn't pass judgment on what the French are doing, what the Algerians are doing. I think that it takes time. As you say, there is a conversation. And when you deal with the younger generation of Algeria, and this is the point people forget, when whatever Mr. Macron might have said, and it upset a number of senior Algerians and the older generation, the younger generation of Algeria, it must be said, is not particularly interested in history. They are looking forward. They do not, unlike their elders, look at France or Europe through what the Turkish writer Orhan Pamuk called the prism of pain. So the young people of Algeria are frankly not particularly interested. This is a key point. They are the future. Let's maybe step away from that prism of pain, and we'll talk a little bit about one issue that is very important to young Algerians, which is the question of visa and the question of migration and accessibility of migration. A few years ago, maybe ahead of his second re-election campaign, the government of France decided to put some more restrictions on access to visa and essentially, I think, slashed the number of visas that were available to North African countries by upward of 50%. And that certainly affected Algeria. And that was one of the motivating factors or key factors behind the spat that we saw over the past year between Algeria and France. Can you talk a little bit about that? What message did Macron convey to the Algerian government regarding migration? And is this going to help resolve this issue? Well, first of all, the immediate quarrel about the one of the reasons, it appears, why visas were cut, they were cut to Morocco as well, to Tunisia, though much less, um, is that when uh, Algerian or Moroccan citizens residing in France uh, commit, you know, a condemned by the courts or commit a crime or less than a crime, the French authorities then find it impossible to get the necessary consular papers which would allow their repatriation to Algeria. And the same applies to Morocco. And so this is very aggravating for the French. This has got nothing to do with illegal immigration. It's just a question of people condemned in France. And so there are about 500 North Africans who are floating around different, being moved from one prison to another in France because they've been condemned to be deported back to their uh, native countries, but these countries will not give the necessary papers to admit them. So I don't know whether French French pressure has resulted in more in the Algerians giving more of these consular papers out, but it's a kind of it's a non-stop sore. Why? Because at least 10% of the population of France has family links to North Africa, if not more. So the question of immigration from North Africa, particularly Algeria, which was French for 132 years, cannot just be considered as immigration from another African or Asian or European country. Uh, The Algerians have had special laws for themselves. They could still claim French citizenship until recently, some of them, if one of their parents or grandparents had served France. So it's a very complex file. You can imagine 132 years of French rule plus 60 years of independence. So for 200 years in in 2032, it'll be 200 years that these two countries' history has been deeply enmeshed, often in violence, but not only in violence. There have been also plenty of other things. So it's a very complicated issue. And, of course, Macron is playing to a domestic audience. And when, in 2007, he got elected by courting the centre-left, this time he got re-elected by courting the centre-right, so that is a political fact, which you have to take account of, whatever you think of it. That is a fact. But what the president made clear, he made it actually very clear, is that immigration and visas would be welcome to people who had something to offer France. And in that sense, he was quite clearly out to poach the young talent in information technology, which is plentiful in Algeria, 
So uh, the answer is you're welcome in France if you have something to contribute to France, particularly in the ter- in terms of entrepreneuriat. And the French, uh, the platform is being uh, set up in uh, in Marseille, modeled on the Silicon Valley, run by a young Algerian entrepreneur. And the aim is to attract talent from Africa and North Africa. Though I would argue, Francis, that everyone has something to offer to France. Just as you mentioned earlier, when talking about DJ Snake, his mother was a house cleaner whose son is now a French multi-million dollar recording artist. So certainly everyone has to um, offer something. But I, I get your point. I understand your point regarding migration. And I think maybe we move on to talk a little bit more about the issue of energy security. This was something that we've heard a lot about ahead of the visit. What is France's message going to be? Um, Is France going to ask Algeria to increase uh, production? Was there a conversation about um, energy, about gas particularly? And if so, do you have a sense of what that was? Well, I don't think the visit was particularly focused on energy, but it's bound to have been discussed because it's so central to the concerns of France and Europe today. Uh, So the situation is as follows. French contracts with Algeria for the provision of gas have gone run pretty smoothly in the last 20, 30 years. There's been no particular problem. Um, The gas comes uh, to France in in, in liquefied form, whereas to Spain and Italy it goes through gas pipes under the Mediterranean which have been functioning without any problem at all. But the fact of the matter is that Algeria does not have all that much extra gas to export today. One, because production of gas has not gone up really in the last 10 years. And secondly, because it is using an ever greater proportion of the gas it produces for its domestic consumption because the authorities do not dare cut subsidies. So the price of a kilowatt uh, kilowatt in Algeria is probably one of the cheapest in the world. As long as this continues, there won't be any extra gas um, export. Second point, in the last 10 years, the oil and gas company, or 12 years, has been through quite a rough patch because the former Minister of Energy of uh, uh, President Bouteflika, who was a great crony of Dick Cheney, the former American vice president, corrupted the company and did things which in a normal company would have been called high treason. Now he's in Washington. Right. Algeria has not increased its production of gas as much as it might have done. And the third and vital point is that in the last 10, 20 years, Europe has constructed an energy policy where gas is concerned, where it wants ever shorter contracts. Now, gas contracts, export gas contracts, when they started in Algeria in the 1960s and 70s and 80s, and when they started elsewhere in the years that followed, be it liquid gas or through pipelines, were... 15 years, usually, and in Asia, Asian countries signed 25-year contracts. Now, the length of these contracts has been reduced by different European countries, encouraged companies, encouraged by the Commission in Brussels, many, many years. And so the Algerians are not the only producers who've said to the Europeans, but sorry, there's something funny in your thinking. You offered shorter and shorter term contracts, but to develop a gas field, you need at least 10 years, maybe 15. And you can't have shorter and shorter contracts and more and more gas. And this is something which Europe is discovering. It's been hoist on the petard of its own gas policy by what's happened in Ukraine. So the blame does not lie entirely on the Algerian side, as so often commentators say. Also with the policy of the European Union, which has been amazingly short-sighted for 20 years. The question about the energy relationship brings in the strained relations between Algeria and Spain, of course. Do you have a sense if that's a point that came up? Because this is an issue not just important for France, it's an issue that's important for the entire EU. Um, Do you have a sense of whether there's been a conversation about where things stand at the moment between Algeria and Spain, and if there's any kind of efforts to try to mediate the situation? And of course, that also brings up the the 
very, very contentious issue of the Western Sahara and where Morocco stands and where uh, Spain stands vis-a-vis the Western Sahara issue right now. Well, uh, if I stick to gas, I'll just uh, make a few comments quickly about Spain, France, and Italy. Uh, In the case of Spain, relations were fine until earlier this year, a letter from the Spanish Prime Minister, the King of Morocco, conceding a Spanish position which was much closer to the Moroccan position, was leaked by the royal palace in Rabat uh, ahead of its public announcement, which was already, to put it mildly, bad manners, but it caused the Spanish a lot of trouble. Why? One, because they changed their position on a key issue without saying anything to the Algerians, uh, which you would have thought would have been a diplomatic nicety, but I'm not going to go into that. But the worst part was the Spanish prime minister, a week or two, I can't remember exactly, but I was in Barcelona, I've now relocated to Paris. The, the Spanish prime minister had called the president of Algeria to thank him for the fact that all the gas contracts, despite the closure of the pipeline, which goes from Algeria, carries out a gas Algeria, from Algeria to uh, Spain via, via Morocco, had been closed a few months before, but the direct, the pipeline which runs directly from Arzu, the great gas base near Bahrain, to Alicante in the south of Spain uh, was full. The contracts were respected. There was no problem at all. And he thanked the Algerian president for this fact, although uh, the fact that the Algerians respect their gas contracts is nothing particularly new. And he asked to come and visit Algeria and so on and so forth. And then a week or two later, the Algerians wake up one morning and they find a leak from the palace in Rabat. So you're forgiven for having a reaction which was rather strong. Maybe their reaction was a bit too strong. They didn't touch the gas contracts at all. But they denounced the Treaty of Friendship and they made quite clear they didn't want to see the Spanish prime minister And by inference, Spain would not get any major contracts in Algeria for the time being. Now, since then, we've had a a cacophonic orchestra playing between Spain, France, and Brussels, where everybody is saying something slightly different about the Western Sahara. But the Western Sahara issue is a very complicated problem. It can't be wished away by the Abraham Accords when Trump recognized the Moroccan sovereignty on the Western Sahara in exchange for Morocco uh, having diplomatic ties with Israel because the Western Sahara is a colonial Un, quote unquote problem in the eyes of the United Nations. So you you can't you can't wish that one away, and so the Spanish have been, I would say, very uh, maladroit. They really mishandled this one, and what makes it worse for the Spanish government is they've put a complete gag on their diplomats or officials in the Ministry of Energy briefing journalists. The Spanish journalists. Absolute furious. Never in the history of modern Spain has there been a complete gag on anything to do with Morocco and Algeria. So everybody's now groping for explanations and answers. I get calls. I got calls when I was in Barcelona from senior officials virtually apologizing they couldn't speak to me. But I've been in this game for 40 years, so it's completely ridiculous. One must note that the great beneficiary of all this kerfuffle are the Italians, who the president of Italy went to Algiers last November, uh, initiated major discussions about oil and gas. The uh, Mario Draghi went last spring, and any the Italian national company have concluded massive programs of investment in Algeria, which affect gas, oil, hydrogen, etc., etc., etc. And the Germans are now coming in discreetly, asking gas, uh, offering more contracts, and so on and so forth. So the Algerians have found an extra 10 billion cubic meters of gas, which will go to Italy. It'll be increased from 21 billion cubic meters earlier this year to 31 by the end of next year. And the Italians have the further advantage that the Italian oil and gas industry is infinitely more sophisticated than the Spanish one. The Italians invented underwater gas pipelines. The first underwater gas pipeline was laid under the Strait of Sicily in the early 1980s. So Italian companies have 
everything to offer the Algerians what they need. And then, of course, the Algerians continue to have their relations with France, with Japan, with the United States. So in a way, they don't need Spain. So Italy is delighted. France, French companies, NG, Total, have their relations, and uh, these relations can be bumpy, but that's true of any gas or oil contract in the world. That continues, and the Occidental is going to invest much more money. The Japanese are probably doing things. The Chinese are doing things. Um, you know, so, so Algeria will increase its production of gas in the years ahead, but as things stand this winter, and we all know this, there is no more gas to go around. So the gap, the huge gap we have with the Russian supplies may be being cut off. I think it's about 100 billion cubic meters. There is not 100 million cubic meters of gas floating in the world. There isn't even 20. So you know, this is not just an Algerian problem, but the Algerians are an important partner. And the other point which should be made, which is important, is that many, there's a lot of Algeria, which is Africa's largest country geographically, which have never been explored, which would probably yield gas and oil. There are also areas which have been exploited, which have been uh, drilled or, you know, which have been explored 10, 15, 20 years ago. But technology in this industry moves fast. And there is no saying that you will not find more gas if you do not use the latest method, methods of ex exploration in areas which are already reasonably well known. Mm -hmm. And so for Algeria to, to capitalize on these, what would they need? Do they need more investment? Do they need, does Sonatrach need to invest more in its infrastructure? Do they need to invest more in their technology? What is it that they need to improve or to ramp up production long term, not necessarily for this coming year? Well, they took, like many countries, but the Algerians in particular, took a very restrictive attitude to foreign investment. You know, they tighten the rules when the price goes up. Then, of course, when the price goes down, you do exactly the contrary. So uh, two years ago, two and a half years ago, after the great Hirak uh, sort of popular revolt, uh, they enacted a new law which loosened, liberalized the rules of investment. And uh, that took time to get enacted because of COVID. Basically, everything was delayed by a year and a half. But now the companies are coming in and are very interesting, interested. So the only hope is that Algeria maintains a kind of even keel or a steady hand in terms of it doesn't start changing the rules every two or three years because a lot of people do it, but it doesn't help particularly, particularly when you're dealing with companies which have to take a five or 10-year term. The second point is how is Algeria getting over all the turmoil in the oil company, Sonatrach, uh, which was initiated, which started with this stewardship, if I can call it that way, of Mr. Shakib Khalil from 99 to 2011. So the hope is that they are slowly getting over this, but they have lost a lot of senior people in the process. Sonatrach is a company of over 100,000 people. It's one of the biggest in Africa. So when you have this kind of turmoil over 10 years and corrupt leadership and uh, of a company, it takes its toll and it takes a long time to repair. So I'm sure they will come back. They've got very good engineers, but they need the technology. And then the money, they've got money at the moment. But, I mean, uh, the, the, it's billions of dollars we're speaking of for every well. So you need the technology. Francis, I want to switch gears a little bit to talk about Russia's relationship with Algeria. And what was Macron, what is the French delegation trying to convey to Algerian leadership in terms of their relationship with Russia? Of course, Russia has been a longtime partner of um, Algeria. Algeria buys arms. I think Algeria is one of the top um, purchases of arms from Russia. The relationship is not just military. It extends to other, um, to other aspects as well. So where does... Where does this relationship factor in and how does it play in France's larger calculus, not just in terms of their bilateral relationship with Algeria, but more broadly as Russian influence in, in Algeria potentially grows, Algeria now has the largest, I think has a larger military um, than France, Italy, the, pardon me, larger uh, 
that navy than uh, France, Italy, and Spain. So talk us a little bit through some of these military and security connections between Algeria and and uh, Russia and what they mean for Europe. Well, the relationship with Russia during the War of Liberation, Russia did not provide the rebellion as it then was with weapons. Because Nikita Khrushchev, the first secretary of the Communist Party of the USSR, told General de Gaulle in 1960 that he would rather that after independence, Algeria remained in the French sphere of influence rather than fall into the American one. Right. Then in the mid-60s, the Algerians wanted to purchase some weapons. The French turned them down on the grounds that they were supporting a terrorist organization, the PLO. And as far as I know, but I'd have to be corrected on this if I'm wrong, they convinced the Americans and the British to withhold the sales of arms. So naturally, the Algerians turned to the Russians. And today, Russia provides about, uh, well, about 70% of the defense uh, purchase bill goes to Russian weapons. The latest Sukhois are in Algeria, fighter jets. They're nowhere else outside the outside Russia. Uh, you've got submarines, you've got uh, tanks, you've got uh, uh, MiGs, you've got all kinds of, um, of weapons. Um, and uh, the, um, the Russians in that sense have got a long-standing relationship, which I don't think will change. On the other hand, the Russians have tried, as the USSR did, to get bases in Algeria, notably the uh, naval base of Merci kebir near Wahran, which is a magnificent uh, place as a base. I know it well. I mean, I, I know the area well. But the Algerians have never granted anybody the permission to have, uh, to have um, a base or military presence on their own soil. And so in many ways, uh, Algeria is non-aligned. Non-alignment might have gone out as a political international factor 20, 30 years ago, but the Algerian, and particularly the Algerian army, is sticks to its theory and its belief in non-alignment. So that's the first thing. The weapons also are purchased from Italy. Uh, surveillance ships at sea, all kinds of things linked with the Navy, because there's a long-standing relationship between the Algerian Navy and the French Navy. And the very good relationship with Italy is historical. And it must be understood because the founder of Eni, the Italian oil company, advised the provisionary government of the Republic of Algeria during the negotiations which led to independence, because at the time de Gaulle wanted to separate the Sahara, where oil had just been discovered and gas, from uh, the nascent state. Mr. Enrico Matti did not endear himself to the French, and as luck would have it, his private plane crashed in an unexplained accident in 1963, a year after Algerian independence. So links with Italy are strong, not just in gas, but also in weapons. Tanks also come from Germany. About 12 years or 13 years ago, I can't remember, the Algerians signed an $8 billion um, contract with uh, whichever German company to buy tanks. And it also buys and has made in Algeria what are called eight-wheel drives, um, armored vehicles. So the Germans uh, have a nice slice of the market. Uh, the Chinese provide the drones. And America did provide in the mid-1990s um, air raid air cover. The system is getting a bit obsolete. And as far as I know, the Americans are trying to sell drones. So it's not just Russia, uh, although Russia is obviously preeminent, and Algerian military officers train in Moscow very often, and then in Germany, in French, in German uh, military academies, in France, in the United States, probably in Canada, in Italy. So, you know, there, there is, um, it's, it's an interesting, it's a, it's a rather unique situation, Algeria, in that respect. If I may, I would just like to add Two points. Uh, one is that in the visit of President Macron, the question of the nuclear tests conducted in 1960-67 in Algeria came up because these tests, uh, there were a number of victims, 
uh, the fallout of the nuclear, the 17 um, nuclear tests, 11 of which were underground, in the Sahara affected West Africa and Southern Europe. But the French are adamant so far. They will not even give the Algerians the contamination maps uh, to help clean up the mess. And the Algerian senior officials made a made pointed remarks in front of the French president and senior French military and security officials at meetings in Algiers a few days ago, that they were very grateful for the Russians for helping them to start decontaminate or clean up the area. So as long as France refuses to even give the maps of the contamination, which exists, which are there, that rankles with the Algerians. Um, the other point that ran, and it rankles even more that the, te- the French test conducted in Muroroa in Polynesia from 90, uh, from 67 to 97, well, in that case, some of the victims have started to be compensated. And bear in mind that in 1960, Algeria was French. So that is a very, very serious issue. And until it is solved, I just don't see the Algerians even thinking of buying French weapons. That's the first point. The second point is what's happening in Mali. The French are leaving Mali. It is the end of an era of French are still in Niger. They have flying rights, their military aircraft over Algeria when they fly to uh, Niger. So in that sense, collaboration goes well. I'm sure on anti-terrorism it works well, because I know the Americans collaborate very closely with the Algerians, and there are no complaints at all like the Americans collaborate with the Algerians on the security of Tunisia. But the Algerian doctrine, as it stands, military doctrine, is we do not want to have outside powers in our region. It is the regional powers which must broker um, um, ceasefires or peace agreements or whatever. The Algerians were particularly unhappy about what could only be called the botched operation in Libya of NATO in 2011-2012, because irrespective of its merits, um, it led to the toppling of Colonel Gaddafi. And as a result, 10,000, I'm not sure the exact figure, Tuareg fighters or Tuaregs from Berbers from northern Mali who'd enlisted in Gaddafi's forces in the 80s and 90s went back to Mali. They took with them modern weapons Gaddafi had bought in the West because nobody in the West seemed to think of bombing the arms dumps when Gaddafi fell. And that started a war in Mali, which nearly led to the overthrow of the regime in Bamako. And from the Algerian point of view, what was worse is that it allowed an Islamist group based in Libya to cross the frontier and attack the gas field of Inemenas, or the particular field of Tigen Turin in 2013, closing it down for two or three years, killing a number of Algerian and foreign uh, workers, it was the biggest attack on a gas shell ever recorded in history. So the Algerians have good reason to feel a bit sore about Libya. And as for Mali, I'm not a specialist, Sahel, a specialist of Sahel politics, but clearly what is happening in Mali, the French being replaced by the Russians, is not a very happy situation for anybody. But that's where we are. Uh, but in all this, I think the main, the main, the, con- the key conclusion is that if Europe, if France in particular, and if Europe, let alone America, which has pretty good relations with Algeria, l'air de rien, you know, the the Algerians, the the, the the Americans meet regularly, so there's no problem. The if Europe wants to have an Africa policy, a policy beyond North Africa, well, you just have to look at the map, and. Algeria, you just can't construct a policy if you're not engaging in a dialogue with Algeria. Now, we haven't spoken about the Western Sahara, and I don't particularly wish to comment on it because it's one of these conflicts which, as James Baker, the former Secretary of State, said when he led the United Nations uh, uh, mission on the Western Sahara at the turn of the century, he said there is no political capital, and I suspect he meant in Washington or Paris, to solve this problem, and therefore this problem is unsoluble. So 
that problem has festered for over 40 years. There's been no, I'm not saying it's easy to solve, but there's been no real will to solve it on the part of certainly the Americans and the French. It's going to be much more difficult to solve now, even if you brought in, say, the Saudis or the Russians, I don't know who. I mean, it's going to be very, very difficult. And that frontier between Morocco and Algeria is closed, thus depriving trade. I mean, trade and investment are non-existent in North Africa between the different countries. And that shaves at least 2 to 3% off the growth of GDP every year, thus making the problems of unemployment and poverty worse. So we're faced with that problem. But the Europeans, it must be said, the French in particular, never thought it was important enough to try and address seriously until recently. Now, even before the Ukraine thing, they would like to move forward. But for 45 years, a different game was played. And as always, you pay the price of history. (laughs) It's as simple as that. Francis, let me close with one of the questions, going back to one of the points that I made in the first question. You said that the French president largely achieved what he wanted to achieve out of the trip. Do you think Algeria got what it wanted out of the trip? Well, it. Uh, I think the Algerian leaders are probably a bit frustrated. They put on a great show of uh, friendship and everything, and thing and things went well. Uh, as uh, the personal chemistry between the two presidents, I wouldn't comment on because unless you know people individually, there's no no point in comment on this kind of thing. In any case, it's relations state to state. The question is the Algerian army, which holds the whip hand. That's what matters. Um, So it went well. The French certainly, I think, conveyed a very clever, in my view, message of soft power. Uh, Macron has got his own agenda, including domestic, which is fine. Uh, The Algerians got the first state visit to North Africa of a newly elected French president. Um, But the Algerian, uh, the Algeria suffers from a problem. If it does not reform its economy, If its leaders continue to display a complete absence of economic strategy, of sense of the future, then uh, life will not be all that pleasant, particularly for the young, uh, enterprising people. And don't forget that more than half the population of Algeria is under 30 years of age. So as long as the army does not have an economic vision or the civilians don't have an economic vision, You can have a powerful army, which by all accounts is professionally managed. The officers are highly, I've met over the years, a number of Algerian senior officers, they're they're very well trained, they're highly intelligent, very nationalist, but they're not fools at all. And they do represent all the population. Uh, The Algerian professional army is drawn from every region, every walk of life, every uh, city, every class. So to that extent, it reflects the nation probably better than many Middle Eastern armies. But as long as the leaders of the army and the civilians do not craft a reform project on the economic front, put an end to this command economy where the banks are a Jurassic Park. I mean, it's just not true. More and more young entrepreneurs will emigrate, not just to France, they go to the Gulf, they go to England, they go to America, they, you know, they, they go, they're, they're in demand because they're very, very good people. They're very determined people. They're clever. But that's up to the Algerian leaders. So those in Algeria, and there are plenty who complain that Monsieur Macron is poaching Algerian talent, the answer is very simple. Well, reform your own system and make Algeria more attractive. Thank you very much for joining us for today's episode, Francis. Thank you. This is all we have time for today. I hope you enjoyed our discussion. I want to thank our guest, Francis Giles, our production team for their work on this episode, and thank you, our listeners, for tuning in. For more North Africa and Sahel content, please check out our website, www.mei.edu. You can also follow MEI on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. And be sure to subscribe to our email newsletter for the latest analysis and information about our upcoming events.
I'm into Sarfakir, and this has been Middle East Focus. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support. Thank you.